Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome everyone to the 17th episode of By the Bywater. Great to have you all back with us once again. We're glad to be with you again. We were just talking before recording how this past month felt like like fighting our way through thick, miserable jello or just something just <laughs> bleh, doldrums, <laughs> literal doldrums, you know. Mm-hmm. And this is not to you know negate anything about the seriousness of the events of this past month, year, everything, and all the rest of it. But man. We've already hit a bit of a wall, but we've got enough energy to do this, and we will be here for you for this. Yes. So, <laughs> doing well, our best. Summon, summon all our reserves. This is just a relaxing break. I mean, even given the topic this time. Yeah, right? I know. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, from musicals to something else. And uh, we will get on into that. Uh, we uh, don't have much more to add that we haven't said already. We hope you're doing well and staying safe, of course, and we will continue to say that. Whew. <laughs> as we make our way through the t- through time. <laughs> so, but in the meantime, let's just go right into it. We do have only one news item, but it's some news. So, as always, please, Jared, go ahead and take it away. There's been various uh, confirmations that the Amazon series has swung back into full production, uh, taking advantage of New Zealand's success and holding off further coronavirus disruption. Good for them. Yay. <laughs> so happy for them. In, in early July, uh, J.A. Bayona posted on Instagram talking about filming with cinematographer Oscar Falra, um, who has worked on and off with Bayona ever since The Orphanage. Uh, meantime, while there was no official presentation at San Diego Comic-Con's online incarnation this year, various members of the One Ring.net presented on a panel along with Tolkien scholar John Garth. According to them, besides some talk about how the cast is a tighter bond now due to having to wait the pause out together, the production now has more New Zealand cast members as well as the greatest number of New Zealand production staff ever, which is saying something considering Peter Jackson's work and the you know the continuing Avatar film production, yeah. which is <laughs> never going to end. No. <laughs> they, <laughs> they also made the first formal claim yet that besides Galadriel, both Elrond and Sauron will be in the series. Although, you know, who exactly is playing the latter two characters, as is the case with every cast member, except her as Galadriel. <laughs> Morvith Clark. It's, I'm, Mor- Morvith, Morvith Clark. Morvith Clark. Um, except her. Um, we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about this. It, it is, it's both logical and good that we have this news, simply because... I think pretty much ever since the news that the series would focus on the Second Age, I think I, we were talking about it, that pretty much those are the, your three through-line characters uh, from mm-hmm. the film adaptations um, in terms of greater familiarity. And so the fact that they're being named doesn't surprise me at all. But it also occurred to me, and just throwing this back out to you guys, is that we've got a situation where these are the three characters who, above all else, are the ones who have to make it through. <laughs> they're the ones who have right. to make it through the series because they're going to show up all the way, you know, thousands of years later. And it occurred to me we have an interesting dynamic here that is not really, say, you know, if the series is looking to differentiate itself from something like, let's say, Game of Thrones, then the fact that we have, you know, then the Game of Thrones, the whole idea with that was that theoretically any character could die at any time. We know it didn't right. quite work out that way, but there we are. So we have a case where we've got like three characters who sort of have to be the... Again, I'm phrasing this in TV terms rather than, let's say, Tolkien terms. It's sort of like, Mm -hmm. here's your three continuity characters, and then everyone else is kind of there. And that led me to some interesting dynamics about how you might structure a series around that if, in fact, they're going to make it more central that way. But I don't know. I mean, Oriana, do you have thoughts about how this would play out in terms of a writer's room planning thing, sort of like, you know, what that would mean? I like I guess it is nice to have certain characters that are I guess sort of your tent poles. Um hmm. I will say I you know and I don't want to give the impression that I have ever worked in a writers room to anyone listening. <laughs> uh I would love to, but I have not actually done that yet, so uh don't think I have too much special insight here. It it is nice to have that as a structural it, it is something to build around and that's nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is one of those things where most people will know that these three have to make it through, but then it gives you all sorts of room for surprises. Um, although I hope, I hope that they don't lean into that too much. Like, 
I'm just kind of over the shocking death for shocking death's sake. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. The creative team does seem super great. They're all really good. And I I don't think that we're in too much danger of them doing that unless there is severe interference from Amazon. I haven't heard too much about the Amazon style of interference, Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. (laughs) As with everything in this project, like... There's so much stuff that's locked down for what feels like no reason. The casting stuff in particular, it's like, why, why not? Why not get people excited about Elrond, you know, whoever's playing Elrond? I want to argue about whether he's right for the part. Seriously. Drive the discussion, you know? All all press is good press. Yeah. Hate clicks are still clicks. (laughs) Yeah. It does seem like the, uh, the only other thing out there that had more of a stronger NDA game going on quite right about now may have been the the new uh, Beyonce film, Black is King, because as soon as that dropped, nearly everyone was saying like, oh yeah, you know, my cousin couldn't even tell his mom that he was on that or things like that. So, you know, you you fly that high, you find out, you know, who you really can or can't talk to. So yeah, I think my own take on it is, yeah, you know, we don't want to and I'm not saying this is going to be the case with however they're doing this, but they're definitely sounding, you know, they've already committed to two seasons at this point. So something's all starting to really come together. It's like we don't want to have it be something where like each season is an arc and then at the end it's sort of like, you know, Elrond and Galadriel going like, well, that darn Sauron almost got away with it again, but we oh got to watch. <laughs> and then Sauron going like, I have a plan. And then cliffhanger of the next season. Something like would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for you meddling in <laughs> Easily <laughs> see something terrible like that happening. Whereas, you know, something more Tolkien to my mind would be something more elegiac, where it's more sort of like, oh boy, you know, sort of like you know, time goes on and things just get more rough and, you know, hopes start mm-hmm. to dwindle in a different sort of way. That might be sort of like an interesting way to sort of show how things you know that's almost like dare i say something like battlestar galactica was uh, back in the Mm -hmm. 2000s where you know it starts off (laughs) not necessarily full of hope after that full episode but you know the ship is still together almost still together and by the end of the series you know everything's you know and you you play that in the line of you know fight the long defeat the legendary line from gladriel and lord of the rings itself so yeah no that's a really good comparison i think for how the show could be it's like you you know it's right after the disaster of the end of the first age Mm -hmm. there's a remnant of people some things go well, most things don't. And it's this, again, yeah, like you said, this long, this long process of decay, which then you make the the three rings to stop yeah. that. And it turns out even worse. Like, yeah, that would be a great mo- Well, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Maybe. I'm hoping that that's what they're going for. Hopefully we get some interviews at some point. Like, Yeah. Can you some freaking press? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it does remind me of the original film production in a way where they were pretty careful yeah. about not talking to many people, just various things. But they did have like certain key events where they got impressed, like on yeah. some days at some points along the way. But then, yeah, so this is not even that so far. I mean, there still hasn't been anything like an actual official press day. So uh, we'll find out. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> there we and are. who knows, who knows how that'll even happen. You know, whatever rollout mm. they choose mm-hmm. will look very different because of the virus. Like it's just, it will and it won't. You'll have a case where you can probably do local press and things and get everyone in a room, but then everything else will have to be just sort of remote chat or something like that. We may see something along those lines. So, you know, stuff co NZ will suddenly become the most, you know, yeah. <laughs> biggest news mm-hmm. outlet in the universe mm-hmm. or, or those other ones we keep getting links from out there. So thank you people for <laughs> existing. We appreciate that. <laughs> so, but uh, well, anyway, with that said, we'll maybe know more next month. We'll uh, see where it goes from there and maybe there'll be other news to report. But right now it's time to shift to our our main topic discussion for today that is oriana's choice please you've got the notes you've got the you got things to talk about do take it away the second age is a good segue into our topic of imperialism in the works of tolkien um God, i'm so excited this is like I think I I said this before, and we have touched on this topic. Um, I don't know if our listeners are are quite diehard enough to have been with us from the beginning, but in episode seven, um, we touched on this uh, when we were talking about Gone Berry Gone, which sounds like a an action movie every time I say it. <laughs> Great name. But I wanted to go a little deeper into imperialism itself as uh, and how it manifests in the work and whether Tolkien himself could be considered imperialist because I kept I kept seeing well I saw like a bad tweet 
that referred to Tolkien as an imperialist. Um, and then I s- happened to see like a kind of extraordinary misreading of the story of the island nation of Numenor. And as I was kind of looking around the internet for serious scholarship, I came across uh, some other really, really awful takes that were not serious scholarship, but just kind of exist. Uh, and we won't be mm-hmm. linking to them because I, one of them in particular was like, written by a 17 year old boy who I think had just been introduced. It might, it might even be a troll. We talked about this in the Slack and it (laughs) feels written as though it was, it was explicitly written in order to uh, garner a, a negative reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, I've also seen whatever, a lot of these, a lot of these bad takes are clearly written by younger people. You know, someone I saw someone saying that because Tolkien like lived in Imperial Britain, he had no choice but to be an imperialist. The thing is, is this is actually a far more nuanced topic than the average layperson might think, which again we sort of discussed in the Gone Very Gone episode. But in order to talk about this, we also kind of need to define what we're talking about when we talk about imperialism. I don't I don't want to go all Webster's dictionary on everyone, but mm. <laughs> it is important to define this term. So we're going to go with the definition that it is a policy of extending rule over one by one state over other states generally, but not necessarily 100% always uh, by military conquest. Modern imperialism often appears hand in hand with colonialism, uh, which is generally where people from one state or nation create settlements in and economically exploit another autonomous state or nation. We've got a whole bunch of examples of this, including, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and of course, the British Empire. Tolkien was a citizen of the British Empire. Uh, He was born in one of its outposts, South Africa. He was born in between the Boer Wars. Uh, I think the first one is actually more of like, I don't know, it's not referred to as a war. But anyway, he was taken back to England before the second one began. So we can't help where we're born or where our parents schlep us around the globe. But... (laughs) These factors often play large roles in how we learn to see the world around us. It's just, you can't really not view the world in a certain way if you are raised in it. It's sort of like the David Foster Wallace, this is water speech, which he has some problems, but it's a very good speech. Uh, (laughs) Was Tolkien himself an imperialist? I I don't think anyone can reasonably make that claim, but he does in his work work, it seems, uh, to see imperialism as a sort of inevitable consequence of consolidation of power by the state, which I think comes from his view of government in general. He was certainly a social conservative, and at some point we'll have to talk about the effect of the Catholic Church on on our buddy mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Ronald. Um, <laughs> But he he was not really a fan of government in general, and certainly not centralized government, uh, which you would think would make him more of a libertarian. But he described himself in later years as a sort of cheerful anarchist. He hated war and industrialization, which are two of the key components of modern imperialism. Now, what about his work? There is quite a bit of imperialism in both The Lord of the Rings and related works. It's a pretty big theme that runs throughout the entire history of Middle-earth. But some of it, in fact, a lot of it, uh, remains consigned to the appendices and, you know, the sort of historical works that not everyone, that frankly most people who read The Lord of the Rings are not going to read. Just because it's in the text does not mean it is portrayed as a positive. Uh, it is almost uniformly portrayed as a bad thing that bad people do. Uh, Sauron and Sauron's former boss, Morgoth, are totalitarian in nature. Their desire is not just to subjugate all the peoples of Middle Earth, but to dominate their individual wills. You know, they want to rule over an empire of slaves. And the key word here is empire. They will expand their authority via imperialism. Sauron and Morgoth are gods, basically. But 
empires of men are just as big a feature in the history of Middle Earth, but they are also pretty much uniformly portrayed as it's a bad idea. Don't imperialism. Don't do it (laughs) is sort of the message. But the sort of more thorough explanation of these empires of men and the history of these empires, specifically that of Numenor, which we'll talk a whole bunch about in a minute. Um, a lot of this is not within is not found within the text of the Lord of the Rings itself, and it's only sort it's only sort of referred to. My first question for you guys is: What do you make of that choice? The choice to leave it out. To, the choice to essentially leave that as like. If you want to know more, please see these appendices. Please see, like, this book that hasn't been published yet, a.k.a. The Silmarillion. Well, I mean, I think it it is there as background radiation mm-hmm. because almost all, if not all, of the story takes place in the remnants of an mm-hmm. ancient empire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're always talking about the men of Westerness, the men of Numenor, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. And it's... It, the way it's handled is super interesting because we end up talking about this a lot in the Slack, I feel like, <laughs> mm. um, that the, the the narration of the story itself is is not Tolkien writing. I mean, mm-hmm. the conceit is that it's not him writing. Mm-hmm. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a collection of viewpoints from everybody yeah. who appears in the story. So you get mostly what you hear about the 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 old empires and like the sort of nostalgia for them that does crop up now and then is from humans mm-hmm. who are like yeah i mean we did some bad things but you know it's like mm-hmm. a very a, like almost like the way americans talk about america mm-hmm. these days it's like you yeah, know we're flawed mm-hmm. but we're okay yeah. so yeah it's i think that's how imperialism is in the text so it's not it's not it's not there as explicitly as it is in the silmarillion where the numenorians when they go bad you know they take over some stuff but it's definitely it's there and i don't think it's a positive in the way people that critique the book, like you were talking about, the way they mm-hmm. want to see it as like a positive statement about the empire. The the thing that strikes me is, and this is something again, you know, we talk in Slack and other things like that. Is um, this is based partially on the fact that uh, our, uh, as I think we mentioned in the last episode, I can't recall, uh, but uh, also if you saw us in the Take Your Pick episode a couple of weeks ago, forgot to mention that at the start, um, that our <laughs> uh, our blog network uh, boss, uh, Chris Puma, whose birthday is today, happy birthday, at the day of recording, I should say, um, is <laughs> uh, was recently uh, reading Lord of the Rings for the first time, and in part of the discussions, I brought up uh, something that struck me as he was sort of giving his reactions to it, and that is the, the emptiness of Middle-Earth. Now, Mm -hmm. not the utter, like, you know, isolation or just desolation of Middle-Earth. Rather, it's relative emptiness. There's shells left behind. And, and, you know, Jared's very good point about nostalgia for Empire is something to come back to. In this case, what I want to sort of bring up is the idea that Tolkien is very comfortable with the ruins, I guess is the best way to put it. In other Mm -hmm. words, he is able to write about the absence of something that was there and is gone. And that's a running theme throughout, uh, uh, throughout the book in very interesting ways. Um, in fact, you know, maybe to bring up just, this is one very small angle. There are many different way, routes I can go with this. Let me bring up one very small angle, arguably one of the vanished empires of a sort, but not in the way that we're necessarily talking about in terms of imperialism, uh, would be, uh, the, that of the Ents and that of the forests mm-hmm. and how they've gone. Mm-hmm. And there is a very explicit back and forth between, uh, between, uh, Treebeard and Gandalf towards the end of the book where, uh, they talk about how, uh, where you know uh, where where the idea is that uh, because Treebeard never wanted his his you could say his empire of trees, um, but uh, the ends the end society to completely dominate and squash all other living things. It was not something that was meant to be overwhelming and oppressive. Again, a resistance to the concept of empire. Uh, instead, there is the sense, however, of loss of things that no longer were the brown lands, other things like that, and this other just these little absences along the way, and this sense of comfort with fallen empires with uh mm-hmm. you know detailing what is a mindset like who who are people that come after this point this per- perceived point of past glory what mm-hmm. do you do it's very interesting mm-hmm. that tolkien writes this again we want well, to be careful with biographical and historical things 
intersecting too much. But the fact that he wrote it right is writing stuff like this in the 30s and 40s when yeah. when the British Empire itself was still theoretically a thing. But you can almost sense that, you know, you know the wave is coming <laughs> is mm-hmm. sort of like uh, you're somebody who's sort of adjusting the fact that, well, you know, mm, you know, I, I could say more, but I'll, I'll stop there. That's kind of just something to throw in for right now. Well, I, I don't know. I kind of want to bring up the biographical thing really mm, yeah. fast, please, at least, please. because part of my research was Googling Tolkien and imperialism. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's and a I, great place <laughs> to start. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And some I found a piece that referenced a letter by him to his son um, during World War II, mm-hmm. when Christopher Tolkien was I, I, in North Africa or something. I don't know. Where he, he says... Um, he talks about being patriotic. That's fine. Whatever. Hmm. Uh, and then he says, uh, for I love England, parentheses, not Great Britain, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is hilarious, by the way. Mm. Um, not the United Kingdom, you know, just England. And certainly not the British Commonwealth. Grr. Yes. <laughs> he writes grr. <laughs> he is, his viewpoint is like, he, he's fine with England. He's fine with tiny kingdom ex- existing. Mm-hmm. But he really, and this is, I, again, this is like if you're a teen writing a post on the internet, you're not necessarily going to know about this because right. this is like the letters. Who reads the letters right. except Uber fans? <laughs> you're not going to know that in like in his own life, he was like, you know what? The empire sucks. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. talks another letter about the treatment of color in South Africa, horrifying everybody who visits there. Mm-hmm. So it's the the way that the <laughs> the text depicts imperialism, but that's not the same as endorsement. His, like his, his biography, is, like you have to go to the trivia section essentially of his life to know this but Mm. he was writing from this viewpoint i think that's something that actually gets lost in a lot of criticism these days is depiction not being endorsement and now Mm -hmm. that's not a get out of jail free card i don't want anyone to think that at some point we'll really really dig into the race stuff or maybe i don't know if maybe we're not qualified to do that i don't know So a thing that I have not found any evidence for from the letters from him, I haven't read all of the history of Middle Earth volumes. Mm -hmm. Uh, So maybe, Ned, you have, I, maybe this is in there. Mm -hmm. Um, But a thing that I get the sense, I get the sense from Tolkien and his writing and the, the fact that this all began with the creation of languages that he sees value in tying a language to a culture to a people Mm -hmm. and that empire is a gross violation of this imposing one a different language and therefore culture on a different people is wrong now again i have not found any explicit references to this in in the letters or anything but that's kind of the sense that i get Hmm. well it's that I think this, we keep talking about stuff that came up in the Slack. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Somebody brought up um, Esperanto, mm. which yeah. was a huge thing for a while. Yeah. And Esperanto, for those who don't know, is uh, an invented language. Um, it draws a lot of grammar and vocabulary from like romance languages and other things. And it's very, it's intended to be easy to learn, easy to speak. Um, he hated it because yeah. it had no soul. Yeah. So he, I think he viewed attempts at making a universal language as a kind of imperialism of the mind Mm -hmm. Hmm. and it's interesting that the only there are only two invented languages in the text like only two that were invented by people in the text one is dwarvish which was invented by the vala ale and the dwarves keep it secret it's very much their own thing they don't talk to anybody about it the other one is the black speech which is imposed Mm -hmm. by the dark lord Mm -hmm. on his underlings so and that's why the elves hate it so much, because it's a representation of this domination, this spreading, mm-hmm. this empire. Hmm. There, I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that, a really I'm good just, point. I don't know. I'm not saying it was intentional in his part, but I'm saying there's some interesting parallels, and he did hate that kind of language. So mm-hmm. your 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 point about uh, language and domination just suddenly made me think of something I was going to try and sort of bring up, and this may be as good a way to bring it up as any, is that if we want to view imperialism as a, in in Tolkien, as a particular outgrowth of his own moral standards, let's say, or at least his perception about, you know, what works and what doesn't, and let's cast this within the realm of his personal mythology for Middle-earth, the cycle of stories, mm-hmm. is that um, ultimately, 
it it comes back to it comes back to Morgoth. It comes back to the original sin. The idea that uh, that if the first thing is the music of the Anyer, if it is the idea that there is this everything being in concert, and another voice comes in, a voice who had been one of that, who had been any place, part of a whole, realizing, hey, what if I can take it over and make it mine? Mm-hmm. You know, arguably, it, it's you know, evil itself is this sense of domination, and I think yeah. we yeah. see that play out in different ways. Quite obviously, there's uh, Morgoth. Well, when he was still Melkor. Um, trying to dominate Arda, etc. But I think one of the things that's, uh, for instance, in the published Silmarillion, and again, as you mentioned, Oriana, there's the history of Middle-earth books where there are all these different layers and things. I don't want to go say I know exactly where it was brought in, if it had been in from the start or not. But one of the key things when uh, Melkor tempts the elves, saying, hey, the Valar brought you here. Wouldn't you rather be? And the idea is to go to Middle-earth and have realms, essentially, to colonize and create empires. <laughs> That's yeah. essentially what it is. And uh, to run roughshod over whoever might still be there, you know, which Thingol finds out <laughs> among, among others. So, you know, <laughs> so you, you've got that. You, again, you have this sense and this sense is very much played up again in the published Silmarillion as a big, big factor. This is something that they, everyone realizes. Uh, I shouldn't say realizes, but you know, Feanor and the others persuade him and say, why don't we go and do this? Why can't we do this? Uh, Galadriel in the published text, the idea is that she's inflamed with the desire to have a realm of her own in Middle-earth. Again, realms, empires, domination. And this is seen as a big, stupid thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, and so building on that point, and maybe looping it back to Numenor as the Ur example of man yeah. uh, in this, is this is something, Oriana mentioned episode 7 that we did as a good sort of callback to some of the initial ideas. Um, I want to recommend episode 4, our one on Alderian and Arendis, because that's the story. And this is much later now in Tolkien's work on the subject. So this is towards I remember right, he wrote it in the 50s or 60s, um, I think the 60s. Um, so, again, towards the end of his life, where he explicitly brings in, in the middle of the, the small, quiet, fierce domestic drama that is Alderian and Horrendous, the larger substructure of the worries about empire. And I won't restate what's in that episode over again, but uh, Alderian's father, the king of Numenor, is presented with a choice from the Elvish king, Agil Galad, basically saying, hey, we need help over here. There's something emerging on the horizon. We don't quite know what it is, but it's a really bad thing. It happens to be Sauron. And the way that uh, that uh, Mel- Mineldor, I think is his father's name, the way that he phrases it is the idea is like, what are my choices? I can either keep our peaceful nation here on our island in splendid isolation as is, even though we could be swamped by invaders, or we'll fight back against it, and he inev- he says the ine- it pretty much phrases the inevitable end result is we are a conquering power will kill innocents, and that's a very stark division. And in its starkness, I think we see Tolkien's unease over the idea of you know oh we've got to make sure no one gets us so let's go get them. He's like this is a bad road to go down, and <laughs> this idea of empire plays out. You can tell it's right there. Tolkien basically lay on text going like make the wrong choice, it's going to be bad. And he phrases it in the sense that you know that this one character, the king, feels that both choices are bad and gives it up. Is that Tolkien's perception totally along the way? You never know. He may well be the one going like, oh, yeah, no, stay here and be peaceful is the way to go. (laughs) So there is that. So that, I think, is a very, you know, these deep roots in his own mythology of how it's not solely domination, but it kind of mostly is. It kind of mostly Mm -hmm. is his imperialism on many, many different levels. I'll I'll pause and stop there. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's sort of two different things I want to talk about related to domination. Uh, but first, since we're talking about Numenor, I think we've talked about this in several episodes just touching on it, but the Numenorians, when they go bad, the first sign of their going bad is them taking stuff over. Yes. And before that, first of all, they're just like on their island having fun. And then after so many hundred years, they're like, oh, this is boring. We can't sell too far <laughs> west. We're going to go back to Middle Earth and just see what's up. And they end up almost like a benign sort of not really sort of imperialism almost they a cultural up. imperialism kind of well so ish but yeah this is where it gets a little like thorny in terms of like what tolkien approved of or what he was just depicting is that they show up and they're like oh well everybody here is still like cave people or whatever so we'll we'll show them how to make bandages or we'll tell them how to build stuff so they help they help like uplift the quote more primitive peoples unquote 
and then they and then they leave again. They don't build permanent habitation. They're just there to like help out, and then they leave again. And then when they start building more and more stuff, it's like a sign of their own decay. And then finally, when they become the Numenorean Empire, that's the bad thing. And it stays too. The staying power, like. It, it does feel as though he considers this uh, urge to domination as the original sin for all living beings. We see, like, even Gondor itself, which is founded by the people who saw Numenor going bad and went, oh, we out, <laughs> just in the nick of time. And even they, so one of the havens that the king that Numenor established is Umbar. And you read about this only very kind of briefly in the Lord of the Rings itself. You hear about the Corsairs of Umbar. You don't get a whole lot of history. Uh, it's controlled by the Haradrim uh, at the time. It was originally founded as a haven by the Numenorians, And as time went on, they sort of created it, like turned it into a fortress and, and um, whatnot. Anyway, so Umbar is where the last king of Numenor uh, landed and received the uh, submission of Sauron. And that was where the last king of Numenor brought Sauron back to the island of Numenor. And that didn't go well. It ended in the complete destruction of the island and all the people on it. But, you know, they there were some sort of evil Numenorians that had stayed in Umbar at the time, and so they escaped the destruction of the island, and they built a a, a trip like a monument to this event. And now it wasn't a statue of of the last king of Numenor, but it was a monument to this moment. And Gondor eventually takes over uh, Umbar and they leave that up. This was this ended up being a really bad thing, but even they were like, "Yeah, no, this rules. We love it." Yeah, like this is where men defeated. This is awesome. Yeah, Gondor itself goes on to do do, <laughs> do an, an imperialism. Yeah, to do an imperialism <laughs> by <laughs> on a number of like just a number of different imperialisms that happen from Gondor. The one that is most notable, perhaps, and that again we have touched on is taking just granting Rohan um, land that does not belong to them and that already has other people living in it. <laughs> it's not great. And it's phrased in the snippets that ends up in unfinished tales that it's seen to be the sort of you know lovely event when that happens yeah. when uh when uh, Kyrion and Eorl uh, uh go and uh and they swear on what turns out to be Elendil's secret tomb which is kind of a fascinating element yeah there's a good Tade Naismith uh, painting of of it that I rather like um but uh that uh that this idea that uh, yeah these these the thing about that event that strikes me is that it's sort of like, okay, you know, here and your allies and move here and all that in response to the fact that they were being invaded by another group, <laughs> the Balchoth, who get, you know, the, then, uh, then Aeril and, uh, you know, the, the uh, Eotheod uh, appear and drive them away. And then they said, oh, you can take over this land. And then, as you mentioned, the Dunlandings, but also to a degree, uh, Garbury Gans people, the Druidine and others are sort of like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> you know? Hold on. We like they had been living there since there was a great plague in Middle Earth that wiped out like most people, you know, evil people and good people alike, and so there was all this empty land, and that you know partly contributes to the emptiness of, mm. of Middle Earth. But there's all this empty land, and these people moved in, and it is interesting that you have to sort of view it as Tolkien. The Lord of the Rings is written from the perspective of the colonizers and whether or not we, you know, I don't think that's inherently the worst thing. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Well, it's, <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, the Lord of the Rings is, you know, in, in, in the universe, it's from the perspective of the hobbits mm. who are like, yes, hanging out with the colonizers, but are not themselves really colonizers. So you have, a slight outside perspective. So Mary in the, like the, uh, um, the gone Boy gone scene is like maybe a little more in sympathy in some ways with the colonized. Yes. And in like other scenes with 
I don't know, in Gondor or whatever, like Pippin is obviously overwhelmed by how cool Gondor is. But there's still like hints of other things going on. Like Gondor has royally pooped its own bed Mm -hmm. (laughs) by alienating its neighbors. Like the Haradrim would not hate them if they hadn't killed a bunch of them already. Like they didn't, I don't know that Gondor started the war necessarily, but Gondor has continued it. Right. And in the in the beginning uh, of in Gondor's beginning, like it didn't have to go this way. It didn't. And I don't like it is true. Like, I don't think that like I don't think the message is that it was like, oh, Gondor is correct here. Like D- no. Gondor, I, I, you know, the seeds of destruction, like they're always planting the seeds of their own uh troubles let's yeah. say and they even like various gondorian characters have different perspectives on what this country can mean yeah like boromir is like ah gondor and his brother is like there's that line where he's talking about he would see Minas Tirith a queen among other queens not the mistress of slaves mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whereas boromir i think might be fine with a little bit of domination happening and faramir is like i just want i want a lot of beautiful women <laughs> Mm-hmm. beautiful things just give me beautiful a lot of things. beautiful countries yeah he just he wants a lot he wants everybody to be on the same level yeah. of power and majesty mm-hmm. yeah and he is a gondorian born and raised he is an he is um implied unimplied he's directly stated to be like a pretty pure numenorian so, through, so i don't know how it's not how genetics I, work. yeah i never uh, really <laughs> i think it's meant to be like the true spirit is the intention i yes. don't know but yes. he's like he's got more quote numenorian blood or whatever than his than his brother but for whatever that's worth so yeah it's even even in the book characters from the same place are going i mean we could do this differently we don't have to Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we don't have to be like this Mm -hmm. but even faramir is like he's still captain of the guard he's still killing people in the service of the country it's yeah it's a more complicated than book than people sometimes give credit for i'm looking at you templar teens (laughs) yep (laughs) i love you but (laughs) that's the thing is i wonder Again, a lot of this is not explicitly stated in the book. Well, did you guys... I can't remember offhand if I... Well, there's no way of remembering it if I don't remember it now. I don't remember reading the... Whether I read the appendices the first time I read the books. I, I truly don't know. Do you guys remember if you did or didn't? Oh, very much so. I read... I When I first read the books, I skipped a lot of the history or skimmed a lot of the history i think so too yeah um because it's a lot of it is like whatever you hate about learning history if you hate learning history this is what the appendix the first appendix is it's a lot of names it's a lot of dates it's a lot of and then so and so son of so and so to, yeah. yeah so i definitely skipped a lot of it and paid attention to like what the elves were doing <laughs> yeah this time i'm i'm the opposite i'm a history buff so frankly i was all over that <laughs> i was like going more and more well, I'm a history buff too, just more about elvish history. <laughs> I need it in a different format because it's very much written like Appendix A is very much it feels like a like Genesis or or It's what's, a very dr- yeah, very dry chronicle sort of tone. What is not um Exodus? No, what's the one with all the where it's just like a list of so and so begat, so and so begat so like um, Oh, that's all over the place. It's part of Genesis. A lot of yeah. But uh, N- numbers in Deuteronomy are like that a lot. That's that's what I'm thinking of. The thing that's sort of interesting to me about Gondor, or one of the things that's interesting to me about Gondor, and this this almost verges into, you know, you know about George R. R. Martin wondering about what the tax policy is, but uh, about oh, on, a, on, on a more 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 grounded, interesting level is that as a polity, let's say, mm-hmm. as a nation state, it's vague, and that may sound flippant, but um, it's it's not. Uh, it is something that I think uh, Tolkien is trying to do some sort of direct compare and contrast to a degree. It is not a militarized empire. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not even a militarized you know kingdom, even along the lines of let's say something like Rohan, which is a little more organized in terms of war bands and groups and things like that. You have a sense how it plays out. It's not a militarized society through and through, but there's a kind of more sort of overall sense that sort you know, of warrior society. Yes, yes, that's a thing. good way of putting it. Is there's some level of relative organization, whereas the uh, the closest we get to views of what Gondor is like, 
kind of happened in two spots. First, there's the uh, part where Aragorn, uh, Legolas, and Gimli go through uh, the Paths of the Dead, and they're going through that part of Gondor. And it's like there are mentions of towns and things like this, but otherwise, again, fairly quiescent, mostly rural areas, very, very quiet areas, not very heavily populated, it seems. Now, part of that is due to the other scene that's a little earlier in that uh, in book five of the six books of Lord of the Rings. Uh, long story if you don't know that detail, but anyway... <laughs> Um, is uh, where the uh, where it's uh, Pippin and Burgil are watching the uh, the fiefdoms, the various military components. Oh, I mm-hmm. love that sequence. Wonderful sequence. Uh, the thing that I always wondered about later years is like, so did they time that so everyone arrived at the same time? But anyway, you know. Yeah, is that is that the most efficient way of moving all these people in? There must have been like a proclamation that was like the steward summons you on this day. Yeah, yeah exactly. Be here then. <laughs> but um, it gives a sense of the different power levels of what you could say are the lands of Gondor, mm. uh, the regions of Gondor. And they vary wildly. You have everyone from Imrahil and Dol Amroth, a very, very fascinating, interesting. My boy history and everything like that. The closest thing there is to an actual royalty still in in the uh, kingdom, separate yeah. inside the stewards is sort of like quasi-royalty. That's actual royalty. Um, the prince of the land. To like scattered fishermen from way the heck along the way at the Langstrand, almost the other end of what is currently the land of Gondor with no real captain or things like that. So in other words, it's it's it is not a, you know, there have been comparisons in the past. This is me getting my history geekness on. There's comparisons in the past to things like that, uh, that Gondor's Rome was like the Byzantine Empire, you know, something mm-hmm. after the fall of Rome. It's something mm-hmm. that held onto it. But the Byzantine Empire was, especially in various points of history, incredibly organized down to you're here, you're here, and these are your men, and this is what we're doing, and things like that, you know, on a military and other level like that. You don't get that from this. This is much more relatively amorphous. It's almost sort of like we're here because we're here. Yeah, it's sort of ad hoc. It reminds me of like, <laughs> let's have the history geek off <laughs> Athens and the the League, where it was Athens mm. was in charge, mm. but it was a number of other city states of widely varying power, influence, military might. But Athens could summon them when it needed to. Right. So it, yeah, it's it's not. I know people would compare it to the Byzantine Empire because it's the it's the remnant of a much larger thing. But I think it's a lot more. It's I think it's implied to be way yeah way less organized, like you said, and. It's just kind of a collection of stuff. Yeah. And I think you raise a good point because I seem to remember that the idea is that, you know, they cheer all the they cheer all the soldiers when they all come in, but after they're all in going, they sort of grumble at each other, going like, Man, I should have sent more. Yeah. yeah. It's like this, oh, that's it. And yeah. it's sort of like, you know, it's just a very interesting little detail that I think says something. And you compare that against what is obviously, you know, the big bad empire, Sauron and Mordor and all that, and that's much more seen as, Hi, who's your king? Him. <laughs> you, know, you will do what he and they say the end. <laughs> You know, much, much different scenario. Talking about Sauron and his management style. <laughs> <laughs> How to win friends and kill people. <laughs> <laughs> well, and influence people actually does kind of work because that is one of his uh, things. Because that is what's strange about or interesting about the Haradrim. And like, boy, there's a whole bunch of uh, racism there that we will oh, God. maybe discuss <laughs> at a different time. You know, it doesn't seem like Sauron actually, like, has complete dominion over them, necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so- it's sort of implied that they hate Gondor because Gondor has kind of... They have warred with each other even before Sauron, like, was really a power there. Mm-hmm. So what is, is... Does Sauron only really have true dominion over the orcs? I th- yeah, I mean, I think he's got true dominion over mordor Mm. yeah and then everybody else that he is able to summon is like a treaty or they're like a vassal state or in the case of people like the haradrim it's because they freaking hate gondor and he's able to use that Mm -hmm. and it's very interesting that aragorn specifically after all is said and done uh doesn't as far as we know launch you know sort of like you know (laughs) attacks or anything he makes peace with them Mm-hmm. You know, it may be a temporary peace, but it's sort of like, you know, Sauron's going to the first thing is to do is to not try and like conquer every last little bit of what Sauron had, however ill defined it was. He specifically yeah. grants them peace. He specifically, yeah. you know, we don't know the origin of the who the slaves are who run the fields uh, near uh, near the Sea of Nurnan. We know their slave fields. Oh, I love that. He gives them to them. So it's sort of like, okay, you know, what's their story? Were they always there? Were they a conquered people? Were they like the helots of, uh, of Mordor, essentially? You mm-hmm. know, it's it's not said we don't know 
And yeah, so that's it's it, it, it yeah, it's I would argue that the supernatural nature of Sauron allows him to create a sort of hyper empire that doesn't never really existed because instead of there being a line of succession, there's always the one guy yeah. <laughs> and his and his nine immortal servants. So it allows it to make a much more melodramatic view of empire and continuity than you could in any sort of you know realistic fantasy horror <laughs> or <Yeah. laughs> things like that. But uh, but which I you know is the point. It almost feels like I okay I am not a colonized person, <laughs> so just take this with a grain of salt. It's like if you if you were in a, an Indian in India under the British Empire, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter who the sovereign is. It's gonna be it's gonna feel like it's the same person because nothing is gonna change. Things did change eventually, obviously, but it's just like it's a foreign power and they're gonna screw us over no matter what. So it's, it's, I don't know if that's intentional in terms of like, well, it's just the one guy. It's, he's shadowy, mysterious, he's distant, but it's, I don't know, that just kind of a half formed metaphor <laughs> in my head. Now, Oriana, do you want to? That's a, a really interesting point. Cause that is kind of what totalitarian leaders in particular desire is to like, and that's why they tend to fall apart mostly like or at least like get a little more relaxed after the initial person who set them up dies although we're seeing differently with uh, north korea so Hmm. maybe not but it is like if you only had one guy in charge it's a lot easier to do that (laughs) and we have examples in both you know, if we're, we're, if we're talking about the kingdoms of men, if we're, we have examples <laughs> yeah. in both Numenor and uh, and uh, Gondor of, you know, factions and families essentially reacting against each other. Uh, there's the uh, I can never the kin strife. That's the big yeah. civil yeah. war of of Gondor's history, which is really fascinating. And who it's knows if the so TV series would ever get to that? But that would mean a really long series, I think. Let's just do the history of Gondor. <laughs> But that's as close as Tolkien gets to, I don't want to say Game of Thrones, but more like a War of the Roses. Um, and that ties into all sorts of other interesting factors, too, including, dare I say, purity of blood. Because the yes, idea there that, it is. Oh, that's a whole thing. So there's that there's that factor as well. But, um, you know, we do get a sense of generational conflict between great lords, <laughs> essentially, that echoes down over time. You know, it's not just the one big big initial war. You know, it, echoes, it, it continues to echo down. And this, I think, is you know it's it's not something tolkien's happy about <laughs> i would argue you know every 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 example of something like this is gone it's i think it's interesting that he barely spends any time in those appendices as you mentioned and certainly in any sort of supplemental writing about gondor triumphant you yeah. know gondor is a triumphant mini empire of its own yeah you get details that they were there were stretches where they were like you know okay they conquered all this and then they did all that and they did all the rest of it you get some names but you don't get any details you could argue part of that is sort of like hey if you win you know you win what's the story right. but you know tying in also points that ariana particularly has brought up before how you know military glory is not really tolkien's focus anyway right. and it's more interesting to see how he accounts for decline so mm-hmm. you could argue that uh to tell you back to, I think, to your point, in depicting imperialism, in depicting empire, again, he's not interested in the rise. He's interested in the fall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's interested mm-hmm. in the collapses. He's interested in the fractures. And uh, and I think that explains why he wasn't able to, like, write a sequel to The Lord of the Rings. He came up with an idea, and he's like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they've won. Maybe something far in the future, but, you know, he couldn't do it. Even that sequel was going to be about Gondor starting to decay in a new way, wasn't it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm. I wonder. I wonder if that's a consequence of this sense that I get that he seems to he he seems to see empire, you know, imperialism and empire building as just a thing that man can't help but attempt to do once mm. they've achieved enough power and stability. Mm-hmm. And because it is inevitable, it is not all that interesting to see what led to uh, the formation, like the motives to him, it seems are all one and the same. Whereas the decline, you've got all sorts of options. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and the appendices go into so many, like Arnor fracturing into three different kingdoms. There's this whole thing about that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the, the, so many options. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah just sort of things things 
collapsing societies moving in some cases i mean the whole idea of the uh, the rohirrim and then they were the aotheotis that before that they were over in rovanian and they're like bits and pieces of you know things that lasted for a while and then never reoccurred or things like that it's sort of you know he he, he did, it, Orion has sort of touched on this i believe but the idea that is something something small <laughs> so something a small society seems okay with tolkien an empire does not mm-hmm, mm-hmm. England is fine. The UK is not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The reunited kingdom is a thing in Middle Earth because, arguably, it's because it's personal in a weird way. Because the idea is that you know Aragorn wants to marry the love of his life, and what does her, what does the father-in-law say? Uh, you gotta be able to have both kingdoms. He's like, ah, you know, what was more important? The what was what was 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 winning this, creating this new society more important was getting was having her as a wife more important. <laughs> it certainly means to an end, and in a weird way that actually is a very now that i think about it a bizarre and interesting parallel to the aldarian and orenda story all the way back because there's a case where you know empire is not driven by that story that's not a factor in 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 that personal Mm. relationship but it's more like an outgrowth of something you know going against you know it's it's on small small things turn bigger bigger instances i mean there's (laughs) you know more could go on this is half form it's a it's a synecdoche really it's almost, I don't know, this is not relevant to imperialism, but it does remind me of, um, in the Silmarillion, Finkel asking Baron for the Silmaril mm. as the price of Luthien's hand. It's like, you've got to give, give me something impossible, and then you can have my daughter. Yeah. Right. And Aragorn does it. Yeah. yeah, he's like, okay, fine. Yeah, which is, like, kind of gross if we're talking about, like, reconquering an old empire, Does it, but... <laughs> I think the I think the thing though coming back to the question of emptiness is that this would have functioned much more differently and I think other fantasy series in particular but you could also argue just historical novel series do this differently as well because they you know you talk about you know lands teeming with great cities or things like that where mm-hmm. there's much more of a sense of a fully developed society the perverse advantage here and in a weird way not that this is a new world scenario it's not uh, but uh, but it's an emptied world it's sort of like like, there's enough of blank slate now that you can just put in a kingdom. I mean, the whole idea of like, you know, reestablishing Arnor is sort of like, great. There's like one town. Yeah, there's like Anubinus and Fornost, and that's it. It's, yeah. yeah. It's sort of like, okay, you, you want it Have if you want to claim that. it. <laughs> you know, you got to rebuild it. Move I mean, on in. Yeah. 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 So, which is convenient because it avoids the question. You know, it it's is. a way It's a way for Tolkien, arguably, to showcase a good imperialism, you could say, because in a, in a perverse sense, and that's sort of like, oh, it wasn't causing anyone any trouble, which is like, well, okay. <laughs> you know? There is, yeah, this granting of lands to certain people, like after the war of the ring is you're like oh thanks thanks for giving me back control over this place where i've lived thanks for, for giving thousands. us the shire where we've been for right and the the druidain um and even umbar like yeah. it's like okay mm-hmm. yeah. fine i give you you know leave to uh we talked in the gone Bury gone episode about um how Tolkien was a proponent of home rule for Ireland, Mm -hmm. which is not the same as independence. And uh, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, oh, no, this is still kind of imperialistic. But, you know, again, it... Which even then is still interesting because he's still kind of, kind of taking apart the empire. Right. To give give it back to the people who originally had it. Yeah. Um, Not... Not fully. It's again, like you said, it's very much like a home rule for Ireland kind of thing. But it's still very interesting, especially in the context of the time he was writing, where like, right? Uh, when did the, the British Raj ended in forty seven? Yeah, around Lord the Rings time. came out. I think after that, but he would have been writing around the time that the empire was collapsing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is a very benign way of having an empire come apart. Is just be like, yeah, we won. So as a reward <laughs> yeah take your own land that you already have when really it's because who wants to deal with all that hassle like i mean that really was a huge part of it too i mean you know we, this, is, this is not a history podcast but yeah let's just say that uh, you know the, the english government the english government the uk government was in hock for a lot of things to a lot of different people after world war ii <laughs> and there's there's much more besides but recognizing the inevitability you might as well have your own choice in the matter i was i i just got uh, I recently got a book uh, about the rise of the East India Company, and boy, that's an eye opener. I like I can't, we like didn't just cover that at all in any of my history classes, and I kind of do you see any 
parallels between the East India Company and Lord of the Rings? Do you want to elaborate was on that? I kind of... Uh, so I've only gotten through, like, the mid-1700s of the East India Company. And okay. it does, like... The one thing is that, you know, Numenor didn't, co- like, start colonizing Middle Earth. Uh, well, they kind of did for resources, which mm-hmm. is what the East India Company did. Um, and they were able to to have what for them was success and what was horrible and awful for everyone else, you know, the actual people of India. Uh, <laughs> because... Indian history uh, at that point, like there was so much, it was so fractured. The Mughal empire was declining Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, left some, some room for the East India company to exploit uh, all these places. But it is, it's, it would be interesting. They don't quite map onto each other. Mm -hmm. Um, I almost wish they did. (laughs) I would be surprised if he had. Yeah, it's too, it's too. Applicability too, rather than allegory, you know. But yeah, but even that, like, you know, too, too applicable wouldn't have been to his taste. Um, but there is like, Numenor did exploit at first the resources and then the actual people uh, of Middle Earth that were not Numenorians, And so did the East India Company. Yeah. And there was for sure a power vacuum for Numenor to move in there. Yeah. Because the elves weren't doing anything. I mean, they had their own little realms, but they weren't dominant anymore. No. And Sauron's kind of not quite there. So, yeah, that's similar. And that sort of makes me think about how, you know, the idea is you could argue that, you know, the first age is the elves who came from Falinor learning, oh, yeah, Empire is bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at what it brought us. And, uh, and uh, you know, there is no elf empire as such Mm-mm. in thing. Mm-hmm. The closest thing to, you know, there's there's a Regian, there's Linden, which is its own thing, which seems to be just sort of like mostly sailors going, and you know it's a placeholder yeah <laughs> yeah and then and then you've got uh, and then you've got rivendell which is meant to be a small enclave and then the other biggest lands beyond that are are basically the forest realms lorien and then mirkwood and that yeah. seems to they 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 function differently i guess is the best thing you don't get yeah. a sense of dominance you just simply get a sense of place lorien maybe but that's maybe it's you know nah, it's kind of vague well even like that's the, the difference here is that they are elf realms and elves don't desire power typically mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. that way mm-hmm. the you know that the the noldor when they come from valinor and take over parts of middle earth even then they're like they split into their own realms they're not super into conquering anything right. it's mostly in defense against yeah. Yeah. morgoth mm-hmm. like the biggest most powerful elf realm in similar than is doriath which is co- totally fenced off from anything else because yeah. of morgoth encroaching on everything right and again we see the the language element in there too like uh you know thing all forbids the speaking of any of the high elvish tongues you know he wants I've always to keep... love that detail yeah, yeah just apropos that's... of nothing that's just my little yeah. just a very interesting fact. that's yeah so all of this is to sort of say that oh i keep i see i see calls for to completely like jettison the works of tolkien from mm-hmm. the from the canon. Yeah, from the canon or or from, you know, just uh you know, people shouldn't read really the read these books. And again, that's just the youth trying to who are sort of overzealous and will probably come to a more nuanced understanding, hopefully. Mm-hmm. When you grow out of it. I grew out of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's... I think that's a sort of necessary caveat. But I do think there's just a lot of really interesting stuff in here that we can go on about for several more episodes worth we will you know one of the other essential elements of imperialism is racism Mm -hmm. uh you don't tend to see imperialism without colonialism industrialization or racism so Mm -hmm. for another time Okay, so now it's time to think ahead to our next episode, and it is Jared's Choice. What are we talking about next time? You brought this up very early in the episode, and I was like, oh no, uh, don't say anything, because I want to talk about this. Talk about Ents. Yes! Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, great. <laughs> yes! <laughs> because uh, this is, the, the Lord of the Rings is on some level partly an ecological uh, treatise, mm-hmm. statement, oh, yeah. um, and the Ents are the nucleus of that 
So yeah, it would be, I think, a really interesting thing to talk about. Fertile discussion. Ha 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 ha, as it were. Oh, oh, dear, dear, dear. So, and just also (laughs) interesting (laughs) turns in terms of language because, you know, being Tolkien, he came, gave them a language. So, and it's, it's, yeah. Oh, and that's so interesting too on its own. Really fascinating and interesting. And we've actually been talking about Anson and off past episodes, like how the musical solved the end problem, you could say, in terms of how it and things like that. So, a a rich vein. That'll be great. That'll be a wonderful thing to look forward to. So, that will come in early September. Um, we uh, hope you make your way through the doldrums like we've been making our way through it. Uh, or just sort of like, oh boy, and all that. Uh, we do want to thank you again. We sort of mentioned it uh, casually. Uh, if you had watched uh, the Take Your Pick episode with us um, a couple of weeks ago, that was fun. Who knows if we'll do something like it again, but it was good to do. Look for us individually popping up on various Take Your Picks along the way. I'm, I'm sure things will happen. So, in fact, Jared, you were just on one yesterday, right? For uh, Yeah, 19th century novels. There you and go. It was so, a fun discussion. All right, so check that out. So, you you know, we, we we do we do read other things. <laughs> so, we do occasionally. <laughs> what other books? What? I don't get it. All right, so uh, we just will wrap it up for here. We'll talk to you all in a month's time. Looking forward to it. Until then, talk to you then. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namariye. Namariye.